pleasure to introduce Robert Sluggy from um, Bozeman, where he's an associate professor at Montana State University. Uh, his interests are wide ranging in the area of molecular chemistry, and he's particularly interested in molecular modeling, computational modeling, uh, and has uh, recently become interested in what you can reveal through the synchrotron radiation in uh, molecular species. And today, he's going to talk about um, a subject that I know is near and dear to his heart, uh, a molecular approach to play animals. Yeah. Thank you very much, Ron, and thank you everybody for coming, especially the students. Mm -hmm. I'm so happy to see so many young uh, faces. Not because the faculty is so old, they just have long beards like me. Uh, so what I would like to do today is give you a, an overview of the past, I would say, three years of research where I actually completely switched research topics uh, and research direction. And why I'm here and giving this talk is actually because I was here last summer and with Rhonda and Gary, we did some really important measurements on some of the samples that led to finally a submission of a, a research proposal to uh, NSF and I'm planning to come back and continue that uh, work. The double affiliation what I put up here is because most of this work was done uh, part of my stay in 2014 in Hungary at my alma mater but the whole idea of, of moving away from molecules coordination complexes. It actually came uh, during my sabbatical leave uh, in Japan where I really had a chance to travel throughout Japan and especially the time I spent at the Catalysis Research Center uh, was very influential, uh, changing my view of, of this messy, ill-defined uh, mineral systems to something that worth to, uh, to look at. So here is just one slide with the appropriate acknowledgement for my 2014 leave uh, to Hungary. This is the place where I spent actually my entire uh, college years up to PhD and then went back to uh, 2014. Uh, West Prem is a beautiful little uh, town and as you will see at the end, um, I uh, was able to recruit quite a few students to come to Montana and work with me uh, on this project. So let's start at the beginning. I wrote the abstract also like this contemplative start is like clays. What comes to your mind clays? I need to admit that two years ago, if a guy, regardless whether he has a weird name or not, would have come to, to Montana State and give a talk about clays, I would have probably skipped the seminar. Clays, if you just think about, well, something like this, right? Pottery, maybe mud, dirt. Uh, but if you know a little bit of or study a little bit of chemistry, you know that those belong to the, the big material group of aluminosilicates. So what does it mean? You have some specific combination of aluminum, silicon uh, ions, oxides, hydroxide ions. Um, if you look into a little bit the structure, uh, you have the two most dominant environment, uh, coordination environment in chemistry represented. You have the hexacoordinate aluminum ions and the tetra-coordinated silicon ions, and these are the building blocks, what the uh, clay is put together. So now if you go a little bit deeper, things start to get a little bit more uh, interesting. So if you look at the electron configuration, uh, both of these ions have no valence electrons, so you could call them boring naked ions. And I think it's kind of a little funny to put the boring and naked next to each other because <laughs> normally it doesn't work. But, but here for these ions, they are really boring. They don't do redox chemistry. But if you look at how do they look like, what's the structure? And I'm going to emphasize, if you just look at the atoms, Probably you remember, special students, Jan Cam, how big is, big, big is well, how, what is the size of an atom? Well, about one angstrom. Uh, you can say it's about one angstrom. But when you go into the ions, 
for example, aluminum-3 plus ion, because of all that large number of protons and the lack of three electrons, shrinks. It's actually the aluminum-3 plus ion, the size of it is just like a hydrogen atom. The silicon is half of the hydrogen atom. And the oxygen is completely the opposite. It has this big, black, diffuse electrons everywhere. So already it is set up for an interesting atomic, molecular sort of fight over the electrons. And that's the other way calling formation of chemical, chemical uh, bonds. Obviously, these, the, the oxygen, hydrox too many, uh, it's just too few. Um, so with this um, uh, introduction, this is the, from this atomic introduction, this is the material that I'm going to talk about. This is kaolin in a natural form, or kaolinite. And it's a pure mineral, white earth. Um, and immediately start with an early application. I'm not sure how many of you know about these very unique porcelain, the so-called eggshell porcelain. Very valuable porcelain. It's so thin that the light can go through. And they were, uh, the Chinese, for example, they were making these porcelain in the 1400s using kaolinite. And there's a secret to that that I'm going to talk about later and where I'm sort of tapping into and I, I would like to uh, revisit. So a little bit about the composition. The kaolinite, very easy to remember. Two aluminum oxide, two silicon oxide, and two water. So that's the, the sort of the, the stoichiometry. And the structure, as I mentioned or indicated earlier, is actually very unique. The kaolinite forms these hexagonal crystals, and it's a, a layered alumina silicate. So these are the individual uh, kaolinite layers stacked onto each other like a book or, or uh, like coins on top of each other. And the structure at the, the atomic level, here you see the layer of uh, octahedral aluminum units and then the tetrahedral silicon units, and they form this so-called one-to-one layers, the OT layers, which are connected through very strong hydrogen bonding interactions. So you could simply just look at the picture and vision that you have these uh, uh, neg uh, negatively charged uh, octahedral tetrahedral layers, uh, which are glued together like a sea of, of, of protons. And this, this structure gives, a, especially for, for kaolinite, gives a very unique property. This clay is non-swelling clay uh, by traditional techniques. So for example, just uh, mixing with water, like most of the other clays, uh, it's not going to take up the uh, water, cannot, water cannot enter in between the uh, layers. But in nature, there are different forms of the kaolinite. For example, halozite. Uh, this is where actually you have, over the geological process, you have a sheet of water between the layer. It's very similar. The, the, it looks like the popcorn rock, the highlight rock. It's shiny and uh, just appearance-wise very different. Or you could have the dikite. You could have anions, cations between the layers. Uh, or just exactly the same stoichiometry, exactly the same uh, structure, just a different polymorph uh, form of uh, kaolinite. And this is in the context of what probably most of you know uh, better is the so-called two-to-one tetrahedral, octahedral, tetrahedral layered uh, uh, aluminosilicates, for example, monmorillonite, where you have well-defined uh, cationic layers between the um, the alumina silica uh, layers, again, a wide variety of, of uh, versions of that, swelling, non-swelling. Probably many of you have seen this material. This is the, uh, what Sigma Aldrich and other chemical companies use to ship chemicals. This is a very fluffy, uh, puffed up, uh, uh, soft material. This is actually made of vermiculite, just heating it up, the trapped water molecules just pop up the uh, layers, and they form this very soft, very uh, light density uh, material. 
Okay, so going back to kaolinite and zooming in now really at the atomic level through the single crystal data, what's going on here in between the, the layers within and outside of the layers. So the pink ions are the aluminum ions, gray, the silicon, I'm sorry, I messed it up, copy and paste error, this should be four pass here. Then you have the hydroxide uh, groups, you have a surface hydroxide, inner hydroxide, and you have two different oxide environments. So this is a really complex chemical environment. You have one, two, three, four, five, six different chemical environments. And it's all coming out from that boring ions, what we learn about early on, and it's not so exciting. But as we bring these together, we get something really remarkable. And this is just one way of arranging this, sort of one thermodynamical well. As you saw, there are different earlier, there are different ways of arranging these um, ions. So where does the, the whole molecular approach comes in? So practically from this, when I was looking at this, these uh, ions and environments, they just look to me as coordination compounds. What I studied earlier, you have the metal and you have the ligands around it. So we started to treat this these minerals as sort of coordination compounds where we focus on something, for example, an aluminum ion, and then we look at about 2.5 angstrom environment, the strongest chemical interactions, and we have these hydroxide and oxide groups. And then we continue from the inner uh, coordination sphere to the outer coordination sphere where we have oxides from the adjacent group, we have the uh, silicon ions. And if we continue this way of building up uh, this material, we could end up with these uh, molecular nanostructures, and this is the PhD work of uh, a Hungarian student who is actually right now in Bozeman and working on, uh, working up some data related to the measurements uh, we did. Um, they wanted to come, but I told them they are here till the middle of next week, so they have to work, so I have fun here and we'll tell them how things went. But practically what, what his PhD uh, dissertation is to, to provide support, computational and some experimental support, that you can take these clay environments, for example here, a honeycomb shape uh, aluminum or a silicon uh, unit and start building up these coordination environments around it and, um, and do the modeling uh, structure-wise, uh, electronic energetic property-wise. One of the first stories is already uh, published. Uh, and the idea is that just as uh, showed before, you take the site of interest. Here we took a, a, a honeycomb as a site of adsorption, which is gonna be important later, and then start building, completing the inner, outer sphere environment and then terminating it with uh, uh, cations. And now we actually, by studying the rules of the, the, how the chemical bonds are formed and how these atoms are connected, we can actually generate an algorithm to define a, in any size of a nanoparticle, uh, sort of generations of, of little clays you can see from 152 atoms to up to close to 1,000 atoms, where we have a full control over the, the entire structure in terms of electrons, protons, atoms. Uh, and these are the sizes, about three, four nanometer, which actually experimentally already uh, observable. And what we see when we start, without going into too much details, when we start to uh, look at what's happening with, within these molecular clays compared to the crystal structure, these arrows indicate huge structural reorganizations. So what, without again going into the details, what this means that these molecular clays, they are actually very different than the crystalline clays, structure-wise and chemical property-wise. And this is a slide just quickly summarizes. If you take a, uh, this kind of a structural change, this, if you take a crystalline uh, structure, if you strip away the environment of the adjacent OT layers, the whole uh, arrangement 
the, the, the position of the aluminum ions, the silicon ions, everything changes. It shrinks and becomes much more pliable than uh, when you had these hydrogen bonds stretching out the, the, uh, the layers in the crystal structure. And depending on what sort of environment you have, uh, you can swell this, open it up, and, and shrink it. Um, and here is a, a little uh, animation. Hopefully, I'm not going to crash my computer. Generally, this is when it crashes. Oh, there you go. Shows that what happens if you have urea molecules coming to the surface, and the movements are a little bit exaggerated. But practically, we see this kind of a gooiness as the, 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 the single OT uh, layer starts to deform as the hydrogen bonding interactions from the urea is affecting the surface hydroxides. And then that interaction goes lower and lower and lower. And then the same effect is coming from the, uh, from the, the bottom. And this is going to be important uh, later. And when I talk about modeling, computational modeling, one thing we have to be very, very careful is the level of theory. What sort of uh, quantum chemical, uh, semi-empirical, or empirical methods we use? And here is just a, at least to me, is a shocking data showing the charge distribution depending on what method, what theoretical method we use. It's all over the place. So which one is the right, which one is the correct? We can follow through as a function of the different chemical environment. We can follow through and then look at the theoretically, conceptually most correct uh, level of theory and then compare back with the values. You can see it's, it's all over the place. And the problem here is that these values, especially these, these early on, uh, the, the early values over there, is used in the empirical force field based modeling of these molecular clays. And, and they are actually off. And so all these, that was actually a shocking realization that these dedicated clay force fields, even there is another one more sophisticated force field called the, the interface, which has a really nice description how they build it up. They are off for molecular clays. They work beautifully for crystalline clays, but they are off for molecular clays. And here is the uh, one example. Oops. What happened here? There was a slide here, and it didn't come through. Mm. OK, I'm going to skip this. but. Uh, sorry, I don't know what happened with the slider. But one example I wanted to show that totally misses for molecular clay the, the basic fundamental structure. All of them gives these straight, uh, flat uh, structures, regardless of how you, we do the optimization. However, the, the actual electron microscope, electro, uh, atomic force microscope imaging shows a curvature to these uh, molecular uh, uh, clays. And with specific methods, we can reproduce uh, a curvature. But here comes the question, what is the correct curvature? Because depending on what molecular modeling technique you use, you get very different results. And what you see here with these beautiful colors is a, a, another surprise. The blue color means uh, positive uh, electrophilic side. The red color means. Uh, negative uh, nucleophilic side. And these molecular clays, uh, they called, they considered as a uh, amphoteric uh, materials where you have one side is hydrophobic, the other side is hydrophilic. And if you look at here, for example, the patterns on the surface, they are actually mixed on the same surface. Here too, you have these stripes of red, and then here is white, lighter colored red. Here you have specifically blue and red, indicating that you have two different uh, electro, the amphoteric properties on the, on the same side. So these, these computer simulations, the result, these are never seen before, never discussed before, never been measured in the uh, literature. Uh, but we carried these out with really high level of, of theory. What 
we could sort of base the, the future experimental uh, studies on. One example what uh, we are close to experimentally confirm is to look at the uh, solvation. For some reason, my animations don't come through. I have to show this, though. Hmm. And it's I don't know what happens. I see it here, but I don't see it there. Okay, I have to, sorry, I have to make this up. Um, so what, what I wanted to show is the look at the six water molecule as a nanometer size water droplet, how it interacts with the, the surface of that nanomaterial what we created. And there are many simulations, mainly empirical force field based simulation out in the literature, which shows a distribution depending on what method we use. And what we decided to do is we do complete screening of all the possible structures. And what we were able to show that out of 64 possible structures of how the surface hydroxide and how the water molecules uh, interact, there is only two, only two unique structures, which is within the experimental uh, few kilojoule per mole, which is going to be the dominant species within a, a, a solvated system. And working with the, the Hungarian uh, collaborators, we are trying to uh, actually experimentally show this. But let's see whether this animation comes through. Good. Hold your horses, you could say. I'm talking about modeling molecular thing is how does this come to the actual the real system? I have to explain that. We can actually make molecular clays and the, the method to go from a crystalline kaolinite to a nano kaolinite, a molecular kaolinite, is actually the secret of this way, vase. How you make this, this transparent, very, very thin vases. And the dirty secret is this. <laughs> and I was fortunate to work with a really excellent student, uh, Balaj, who is the, we call it, he's a Kaoli knight, uh, who through the Campus Hungary program spent six months uh, in Montana and actually showed me how to do this. And I told, told you earlier that the Kaolinite is a, a, a particularly challenging clay because it doesn't swell easily. You have to use uh, special compounds uh, and it's, you will see it's going to be kind of shocking what we need to use. There is no rational, it's really everything based on trial and error. For example, here one of the compounds we use is potassium acetate, which actually just letting the kaolinite rest with potassium acetate in a controlled uh, humidity environment, it actually goes in between the layers and swell up, puffs up the, uh, the clay, and then you get this kaolinite potassium acetate intercalate uh, complex, and the uh, interlayer distance increases uh, nearly twice just with these kaolinite, I mean, uh, uh, potassium acetate molecules in there. And then you can do this with different uh, uh, molecules. And then after delamination, you practically can completely destroy the crystalline order. And you get these exfoliated clay sheets, which are now molecules. There's no crystalline order. Uh, and then depending on the properties, again, we cannot predict. We just observe. You can get tubes or chips, platelets, things like that. And two wonderful professors from University of Pannonia, the Surfaces and Nanomaterials Research Lab. Um, I think 10, 20 years of, of, of research gave me the secret recipe to go from a crystalline material to nanomaterials. So you can see, as already mentioned, the first step is potassium acetate, then ethylene glycol. And when we replace it under very unique condition, when we replace it, actually the, the uh, interlayer distance shrink. And then replacing that with hexylamine opens it up. 
and with toluene, toluene wash, we can do the, uh, the exfoliation. And this is a highly empirical uh, uh, process. Uh, very little, practically, no understanding what's happening here. What gives the reactivity? When you can do this, when you cannot. Water content, very important here at the potassium acetate level, absolutely forbidding at the ethylene glycol level. It shuts down the whole process if there is too much uh, water. And uh, Balaj liked me to always emphasize that uh, even the energy transfer, whether we directly heat it, stir it, or using microwave heating affects the uh, intercalation, exchange intercalation, exfoliation effic efficiency. And here is a uh, sort of a quick, quick uh, slideshow showing you how we can monitor what's happening between the layer using powder X-ray diffraction, uh, starting with kaolinite, and also I have here uh, acid-treated kaolinite. And then when we add the potassium acetate, these diffraction peak at high angle decreases, and new ones uh, increase, a new one uh, appear. Uh, at lower angles, uh, indicating a larger separation. You can actually see here that in these experiments, you get two different intercalations. So the potassium acetate has some structure in between the layers. And from the ratio of this and this, we can calculate the intercalation effici efficiency. Then next step, we put ethylene glycol in there. And then what we realized that with acid treatment, actually, uh, with acid treatment, if we wash it, we completely destroy the, the complex and we go back to the uh, starting material. But if we don't wash it, we just keep piling on uh, the uh, adding newer intercalating agents. We can actually go up to something like 80% uh, uh, intercalation. So what happens when we lose the crystalline order? Well, obviously, X-ray diffraction is no longer useful. That's when we turn into the microscopic, electron microscopic imaging. So uh, some of these, I think most of these images were actually recorded here. This is the, what our reference kaolinite, the commercial uh, uh, kaolinite, what we use. You can see beautifully the big giant hexagonal sheets. And this is actually a clay south from here, outside of Dillon. Uh, at, uh, what's the name of the Dice Creek uh, uh, area, uh, which has a very high crystallinity index, but very small crystals. You can see, and it's many of them broken, uh, chipped. There are some bigger ones too, but this is the, the typical picture. And then this is something that I didn't imagine, that I'm making clay. So this is a result of synthetic clay made in the laboratory after 48 hours, huge crystallinity of the chart. Actually, this result led us to, to question the reliability of the, the Hinkley index that everybody uses, because this is just totally off the chart. But then you look at it, um, probably Gary, you, you, you remember, I think you were so surprised when you were like shooting everywhere, it's like the same total homogeneous distribution and the perfect uh, elemental distribution for Kaolinite, these are tiny, tiny, tiny little microcrystalline uh, kaolinite uh, crystals. Very, very high crystallinity, but these are actually dead. They don't do anything. We cannot intercalate it. And this is something that really mind-boggling that if you think about thermodynamics, you have this high surface area, unstable, uh, cr crystalline material, obviously beautiful XRD spectrum, and it's not reactive. And then if you go back, you look at these big, big plates and stacks of sheets together, very strongly bound, well, st it's very stable, it's actually very re reactive. Now, we optimize the, the pr procedure and we can go up to 95, 96% of um, exfoliation. And here it's actually, the result shows that what we get for this, this big, big sheets is these rolls or scrolls, these nanotubes, which depending on what solvent we use, shows either the, the, the uh, silic silicon or the aluminum uh, faces to outside, which actually very long, sometimes micrometer long uh, little tubes, 
the Montana uh, iron containing kaolinite only gives us chips, little platelets and little, little chips. Maybe you can sort of say that maybe there are a few tubes. And there's another clay what we worked with. It's, it looks like kind of a messy uh, clay, but it's a 20 year old clay. It took 20, it takes 20 years for this, the, the, this Japanese clay to purify it, to be able to make uh, pottery out of it. And this one has a little bit of everything. It has tubes, chips, and, and other materials. This is actually quite high uh, quartz uh, content. And so I like to put this up because all what I talked about, this is really just like that, trial and error. We don't, we, there's no experimental handlers to sort of engineer, to predict what we're going to get. We have to do it and we observe it. And then we try to modify, go back, and it's, it's very time consuming. And, and uh, even the, the clay is being cheap, but the reagents are not so. And very often we have to use very strict anaerobic conditions. So to, to get to the right one, we have to simply understand what's happening here. And we are working on this hypothesis, which sort of explains why you need these big, 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 big surface areas and why the small, the unstable uh, uh, clay doesn't um, uh, react. And showing with this animation, so what's happening here is the intercalating agent coming into the side, but only as a response of the, the same molecule absorbing on the top and softening up the, the, the clay layer so this diffusion uh, can uh, take place. Again, this is a, just a, a computer animation. Obviously, these, these um, placements are these placements are way too big, and it doesn't take place. But we are actually through that earlier mentioned modeling, building up uh, three-dimensional models and and uh, running um, computer simulations to come up with the energy profile and try to rationalize what's happening here. And the last part of the talk, well, I would like to talk about a few applications. Because as you know, no science without any application. One of the applications, which was again coming from this molecular approach, molecular level modeling, is looking at uh, heterocyclic organic molecules, for example, porphyrin, the, the simplest porphyrin, absorption on these nanoparticles. And what we see is from, again, fairly high level simulations that it's exclusively, so you can even the, uh, not to mention the entropy contribution, exclusively absorbs on one side. Um, and this is actually really good because we can tune the, the organic uh, material. And uh, that's actually the other uh, graduate student who spent the, with the Campus Hungary program uh, six months in, in Montana helped me build up a little photochemical lab where we can look at using, taking advantage of uh, natural contamination of titanium, manganese, iron, copper uh, 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 oxides, deposit silver on the other side. And so we have these composite materials where on one side we have these tunable aromatic molecules and the other side we have the silver activation and we, ha we can generate free electrons just by light. Right now we are in the uh, UV range or hydroxyl radicals to break down organic uh, molecules. And the other example going back to the Japanese clay, um, this whole idea is that mining clay from here, processing and then finally selling, it takes 20 years. And when I visited the Kasama, uh, the very famous pottery area in Ibaraki Prefecture, they were very interested in these adding different uh, chemicals to speed up this uh, uh, process. And also, the residual of that organic chemicals would may create some artistic colors, pattern, something on the clay. So with a, a dear friend of mine, uh, Professor Takamitsu Kozuma, we are actually thinking about designing uh, experiments and hopefully we'll be able to secure funding for this research from the 
uh, Japanese uh, Science Foundation. And I skip this. And so here is the, the last little story. This is the Daisuke, Dice Creek area where we went and actually sampled and took away some clay. Um, uh, this is just beyond the, um, a private land, but had the permission to take some clay away and took the Hungarian students last uh, winter to go and, and, and dig for a few kilos of, uh, of clay. And not sure how many of you have seen this movie. I really recommend it. It's, it's really an amazing, it's about uh, him who is a national treasure in Japan, the most famous sushi chef. So this poster sort of triggered another post. Oh, 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 that's what I was afraid. F triggered another poster. Okay, I'm going to go back real quick. Let's do the. I'm sorry, I never had so much problem with technical details, but. Um, to the end. It's really the, just the end. Yeah, there you go. 63. Okay. So, what I'm dreaming about. And this is something a little bit of a, a take home uh, message. I dream about many things, but particularly related to this. This was really just an idea, a dream, uh, of using this Montana clay for something useful. And it has high iron content. And I was in the past 10 years or so, I was traveling in the world of iron sulfur clusters in biology. So these iron sulfur clusters with very different uh, composition, two iron, two sulfur, three iron, four sulfur, four iron, four sulfur, or with with seven iron, with molybdenum, with nickel, uh, copper, with nickel. Uh, they do the most difficult, most challenging biological processes, nitrogen fixation, hydrogen uh, uh, conversion to proton electrons and storing uh, chemical energy in, in hydrogen. So they have very diverse redox roles and all of them are embedded into these soft material matrix of the protein environment. So what we got here, we have a hard material. We have the clay with iron. And this is actually what you see here is a stable, optimized uh, structure of a iron for sulfur for cluster. In, of course, this is only in the computer model so far with cysteine amino acids, which potentially could be linked to a biological um, electron donor, electron acceptor, light harvesting, uh, uh, mimic, and then this potentially could do similar redox chemistry, but uh, biology. And so these are the, so what, uh, before I jump to that, because this is a really exciting part for me, because this was really just an idea. Can we do this? And with two undergraduate students, uh, uh, Scott Spring and uh, Tacy Hicks, we started to explore, expose these samples, these clay samples, to hydrogen sulfide under different conditions. And just uh, earlier this week, actually on Monday, we collected the data at the synchrotron lab. So this is, we are using X-ray energies, uh, 2,465 electron volts. So the light, what we use right now here, coming out, visible light, that's about three or four electron volt energy. So three orders of magnitude. And we are, as we are scanning the energy, this is the sulfur energy range. We are looking at different uh, clay samples, exfoliated nanoclays. So the fluca, uh, that's the commercial clay, shows a little bump, something that you may or you may not call, I would rather not call to any positive result. result. Maybe there is some physisorption of H2S, but in both cases, the Montana and the Kasama clay, you have this huge spectrum of features, which are the direct experimental indication that we are forming iron sulfur particles on top of the clays. And I immediately say that we are still far from this, because as you look at this, you can kind of see there are multiple different environments. So probably we have the big jungle there, 
we have we have big particles, so not molecular uh, systems, but at least we have the the sort of the proof of of um, uh, the proof for the idea uh, that this is actually a valid approach, and then this is sort of the goal is to build up these iron sulfur cluster reactors, these nano reactors inside the clays, and do the similar difficult processes, synthesize or, or fix nitrogen, or synthesize organic molecules from, from simple uh, inorganic uh, uh, compounds. So as a result of all these uh, studies, I was able to, the day before yesterday at 11 a.m., submit a grant. So hopefully this is going to help us to uh, uh, continue there's no animation even there. And um, I think I have to move away from PowerPoint. Um, sorry for these technical glitches. Uh, and one thing I wanted to emphasize is uh, my commitment to come back and take advantage of many of the experimental facilities here. I put in, in the other category, originally I put in the consultant services put in, in the other category, some budget for uh, coming back here to uh, work with Gary, Rhonda, and uh, others uh, in the coming years uh, to study these materials and understand um, what we can do and what we cannot. And so before it crashes again, I'm going to just quickly finish with the ac acknowledgement because this is definitely far from being just my work. Uh, many, many people contributed, and not just to this, but uh, other projects. The Ibaraki team, especially Kozuma Sensei uh, from Nagoya University, Stefan, who is helping me learning the density functional type binding methods, and Kenji Hara Sensei helping me accessing synchrotron facilities in uh, Japan, uh, and the students and mentioned, Ron, several of my, my really positive experience uh, with the students, Yamaguchi-san and Kawai-san, who came actually to Montana, as you can see. And we also did some research and collected some data, but they love to be here, so cannot wait to have the financial uh, backing to be able to bring them back. Uh, Takisawa-san is in love with Yellowstone. He came back three times. Uh, he's now working for Texas Instrument and he was on training in Dallas and before he flew back to Japan he came back and uh, we went to uh, enjoy all the time he was here on, uh, during winter time so he promised me that he's going, going to come back during summer. The Hungarian collaborators especially from University of, of uh, Pannonia and I think there are two people who are smiling right because they know some of the, the names uh, uh, here. Um, and the students, the Hungarian students, who from the Campus Hungary program, they were able to work with me. Orsoya, Balázs, Attila, they all worked on clay. And Mercedes, she's uh, still working with me uh, on X-ray uh, spectroscopy. So with that, I apologize for all these technical glitches. I was a little worried because it's, it's Sometimes it happens, but I hope you had a, uh, an overview. Uh, well, I hope that at the end, you, when you ever, you're, you're going to hear about clays. You're going to think a little bit. And it's not just the dirt on your shoes or something nasty stuff on the soil where you cannot grow anything. But they really have a lot of potential, and I hope I will be able to contribute to that. So thank you very much for your attention. and looking forward to discussion, questions, comments, suggestions. Right. Then we saw the person peeing. Right. I don't think you ever showed us any information about what is the secret of the eggshell porcelain. Or if you did, I didn't get it. Uh, that's the intercalating agents. So that's the urea, uh, the potassium acetate, hexylamine. Right, right. But, I mean, but the ones you had in the next slide, right. volume, those things, they don't exist back there. That's right. That's right. That's right. So, so they, Right, you're right, you're right, yeah, yeah. So what I, I did not show that, what they used is animal waste. 
And actually, there is a, a little bit of connection here. There is a potter, or used to be a, a lady who passed away here, lived here and worked here in Butte. And I heard this, this, this story from the ceramic uh, department at Montana State, who actually went to that very clay mine area and took that iron, high iron containing clay, what nobody could work with except her. And she had a secret or had chickens or had cows or pigs or something like that and mixed it together because these, these uh, sulfur, ammonia containing molecules for some reason they are able to, what I would say, soften up the surface, allow things to diffuse in. Simply water cannot do it and you need some salt with it too potassium acetate, that's the best to start with or you know, urea or dimethyl sulfoxide. Probably yeah, they didn't the use. Acetate. Acetate? Oh yeah. I have vinegar. Yeah. Oh. Mix it vinegar or s yeah. yeah. So so that that's the dirty secret. With a little bit of exaggeration. <laughs> yes. So I'm curious about the iron clay in Montana. And why is it red? I mean, is it we all like mixed with anything? Yes. Correct. No, no you are both. Uh, you are right. So it's, it's the red color comes from the hematite, and it's about uh, 15 to 20 percent hematite. Acid treatment uh, lightens the color, but it doesn't whiten it. Just lightens the color, and you have structural iron. And we have a musbar setup, a low temperature musbar setup, where I can crystal clear monitor the six peaks of hematite after acid wash disappears and you have only two peaks which is the structural iron built in the substituting the aluminum and that the incorrect in the octahedra and that's about about five percent and artificially i cannot unfortunately yet but artificially you can make clays which goes up to 30 percent iron uh, iron aluminum substitution. A Spanish lab uh, published this procedure and I tried to reproduce it and I, I get junk. So I, and, and I think we understand that as we wash we actually affect the iron, aluminum, uh, silicon ratio and that's very important to be dialed in right to have the hydrothermal, under hydrothermal conditions to form this high iron substituted kaolinite. Copper, yeah. This actually, this one is also copper, yeah. I would love to play a little bit with it. Blue, hmm. But it's copper oxide. I don't know why it's blue, but if, um, like, we x-ray it, it's okay all night. Right. Yeah. 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 I would love to have a little sample and then just run through and see. It could be what I really would like to know how to replace the silicon with some metals. And maybe there are some natural uh, occurrences, but I uh, would like to control it under synthetic conditions. Are the uh, stability of these uh, molecular clays compared to the natural clays Similar to uh, oh good them. oh you 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 look at them and they already dead sort of so it's very fragile so it's like we cannot stir it like it, we didn't know we learned it so you take the exfoliated nanotubes from the fluke and just just put it on a stir plate and in a solution you stir it completely breaks it up. So it's very uh, grinding. That actually, that's what we are studying now. Is when you start grinding it, it, they start to dehydroxylate. So the hydroxyl groups, two hydroxyl groups, form an oxide, and the water leaves. So they are incredibly touchy, and and that's that's once we make it, there is another art how to handle it, and we would like to purify it. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why I'm focusing on iron is the idea is to have attached uh, a phosphine or some sort of a, 
uh, uh, organic, organometallic kind of ligand on the, onto the iron and used it as a handle to concentrate them in a very gentle process because simple you lose the, it's, they are really like molecules. I mean, it's, it's a little bit kind of iffy to call them molecules, but they are really like, like molecules, very touchy, they break, they, they dissociate and just like denature like proteins. If you don't handle the proteins well, they denature. These ones do the same. Right. So, um, do you think this monoclonal model will work in the same um, fashion? Yes, actually, what, that's very good. But actually, we had the same idea. It's like, okay, great, we did it, so what? We worked out for one, cool guys, that's it. But we wanted to test it, so we went actually a completely different mineral. We went to iron sulfur, a little bit close to my heart. Iron sulfur minerals where you have you have very strong covalent bonds, a lot of electron sharing, very different materials. And we applied exactly the same molecular approach, coordination environment modeling, and we have beautiful nanostructures, stable, no counter ions. We can actually study reactivity. Uh, so the, it, it seems like that we went too extreme, again, just two examples, but it, it looks like this kind of an approach this is going to be applicable to uh, any material as long, and here is it's the disclaimer, that as long as you want to focus on molecular properties. Because if you are interested in periodic crystalline materials, of course, this is a wrong model. You cannot use that because these are non-periodic, these are molecular. But what we learn and see in literature that the the value of a material increases as the sophistication of the surface treatment and the surface modification. So even if you have a natural uh, source for a material, you need to modify that to, to gear the, tune the properties toward a, a certain uh, function and very often goes down to the nano regime where you have molecules. Well, thank you. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.